Welcome everybody to the Sioux Falls uh, Council's informational meeting. Today is the 3rd of January, 2017. First time I think I've used that. Uh, and I think I've messed it up a few times already this year, but uh, we'll get used to it soon enough. Um, I'd, uh, look for a, um, uh, well, I guess I will do that audit committee report. Um, the audit committee report, um, there was uh, basically an executive session, so I really can't report out uh, of what's happened there. Um, but, uh, and I will have to stop at that, I guess, because uh, I really can't go much farther. So, um, any open discussion for the city? Yes, Chris, um, Councilor Erickson. Thank you. Um, just wanted to um, just have a brief um, update on where we are with um, since we've had the tobacco ordinance debate take place. I know I've talked to um, several council members about bringing that forward to the Public Services Committee, which still will happen eventually. Um, upon talking with council leadership um, on January 24th, you will get an invitation um, from council staff. January 24th, we are going to hold an all council informal session, in just a informal work session out here. Public will be invited, it will be noticed as well. Um, that will take place at 3.30 in the afternoon. The intent of that is to really bring the administration and the council together to talk about um, the visions together and the compromises that we can come up with um, directing public policy in regards to the tobacco ordinance. So um, I invite you to jot down some notes, jot down bullet points, anything that's important to you that you would like to see or not see, um, and have those conversations. What we will do is start as a informational, just not informational, I'm sorry, a working session um, and then from there, anything that comes out of that working session will go to the Public Services Committee, and from there, we'll take it, vet it another time, and bring any changes or ordinances forward after that in February. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, speak to Councilor Rolfing or myself. Thank you. Any questions for Councilor Erickson? Any other open discussion? Hearing none, we'll go straight into our presentation then. Mr. Hoskins. Thank you very much for being here. We, uh, with all this happening around this um, archive building, I thought it was important to have you uh, give us an update or a, some background as to why this is all happening. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I know I don't get a chance to talk to the city council too much. Um, Bill Hoskins, director of the Sea Land Heritage Museums, and and. Just as a, a little background, because really when I talk about the museum's collection, I, I have to talk a little bit about the history of the Siouxland Heritage Museums. The museums were created by the City Council and County Commission in 1974 through a joint cooperative agreement. We operate two buildings, the Pettigrew Homan Museum, which is a city-owned building, and, and that has operated as a museum since 1930 and the Old Courthouse Museum, which is owned by Minnehaha County, and, and that has been a museum since 1974. Both buildings were originally built for other purposes. The Pettigrew in 1889 as a private residence, and then in 1923, Richard Franklin Pettigrew added on the first of two additions built as a museum in 1923, and then the city added an addition at the rear of the building as a public works administration project in the winter of 1933-1934. Um, of course, the old courthouse museum was built essentially as an office building uh, and county courthouse in 1890. Both buildings are now on the National Register of Historic Places, and uh, they're, they're great buildings, and they both serve the public well as program and exhibit spaces. What, what they don't do as good a job at is serving as a warehouse. And the majority of the museum's collection <coughs> is stored at the old courthouse museum on the third floor attic and basement <coughs> levels. Um, those spaces uh, actually have no environmental control. So there is no air conditioning, there's no heat. There is no thermostat to jockey. They really work on the convection, the heat of the rest of the building 
for heating and cooling. Um, we also have some concerns regarding some of the, the structure. And um, uh, in my memo, I had some specifics, but um, uh, really that is something that uh, a number of years ago, probably about 15 years ago, I had some concerns about something. Uh, at that time, Jeff Hazard, was an, uh, who's an architect, served on the museum board. And uh, Jeff and I toured the building, and after showing him my concerns, he thought that we should get a structural engineer in. Uh, at that time, a guy named Doug Pedersen came in, looked at the building. Uh, what I was concerned about wasn't the biggest problem at the time. He found some structural damage that was actually repaired in 2007. Um, but, but those concerns have been persistent. Uh, another reason we're, we're looking at expanding is really the museum system has been very successful. And um, our programs um, and exhibits are very popular. We, we get people coming in. 2015 was actually a record year for attendance. And to be blunt, we're out of space. Um, those of you who've toured the building in the past, uh, I know Michelle and Pat probably uh, are very familiar with it, but, uh, and I would invite any of you who want to come and, and see the structure for yourself, uh, you've really got to see it to comprehend what's going on. Um, we were very lucky uh, a number of years, eight years ago, Bob and Kari Hall, uh, donated 25 acres of land uh, to the museum really to provide a site and, and some resources for the construction of a storage facility for the museums. Um, I, I'll just mention that every member of Kari's family have worked as volunteers. Kari volunteers today about 20 hours a week. Uh, during the past year. So she's very involved in the museum. She served on the museum board. Um, anyway. <clears throat> um, when early on, uh, we involved Coke Hazard Architects. Uh, they have helped us with conceptual planning and uh, were contracted by the um, Minnehaha County for design development and, and have worked with us in developing architectural plans uh, up until the present time. Um, project costs to date really have been about $100,000 of that the county has paid $25,000, uh, the city has paid nothing, and we've privately raised $75,000 in support. And that's architectural fees, uh, services, Fees, uh, surveys, uh, archaeological surveys, surveys, maintenance of the land, um, mostly architectural fees. Um, in 2013, uh, there was, well, I should, yeah, uh, 2012 into 2013, there was a joint city and county um, committee that went through and, and looked at the project and the museum's needs. And really the result of that was a supplemental agreement to our joint cooperative agreement that was signed in November of 2013. And, and the real tri trigger for that agreement going forward was the sale of 20 of those 25 acres that Bob and Kari had donated us, uh, which sold recently for uh, $1,429,000. So a very generous gift. Um, I, I think when that agreement was originally signed, the cost estimate for the structure was 3.8 million. Uh, I don't have the specific figure now with me, but uh, the architect, uh, um, well, anyway, I'll get into that. Uh, I think four years later, my, my guess is it's gonna be between 4.3 and 4.5 million total for the construction. Um, the Minnehaha County Commission has expressed a desire to move forward with this project. 
That 2013 supplemental agreement uh, requires that uh, final design be presented and approved in a joint meeting. Also, a notice authorizing notice to bidders and award of the contract that each of those phases will take place in a joint meeting. And so what I would very like, much like to do is uh, have architect Keith Thompson be able to present to you and the county commission in a joint meeting uh, that final design, uh, hopefully later this month. Um, <clears throat> it's really quite a big project and I, I'm curious what your questions are. Uh, I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, are there, uh, do you have any of the drawing, um, preliminary drawings that you had before? There, there are. Um, let's see here, uh, I can open up. I think it might be good for people to see, get an idea of what we're thinking that, of. This it's is a site change. plan. The site is located on what, uh, on Northwestport Avenue at uh, what would be 54th Street on the southeast corner. It's sort of a high corner. Um, our entrance into the site would be off 54th Street. Uh, we need to be 300 feet back from the corner at that location. Um, the site's big enough for uh, expansion in the future without impacting the current uh, envelope. That was something we wanted to plan for for, for the future. Uh, the floor plan basically has a, a number of segments. There's a public area. We do have uh, researchers and members of the public who come and use the collection on almost a daily basis. And so we have a public entry and a uh, place for those people to work and, of course, restroom facilities, conference room. We also have uh, staff workspaces. We currently have three full-time staff members working with our museum collections, a curator of collections, the registrar, and a collections assistant. We would relocate them from the old courthouse museum with the collection to this facility. And the collections volunteers, there's about 20 of them uh, in the last calendar year. Uh, they will also work out of this structure as well. And, and really, the rest of it, the majority of the building is, uh, is storage, is collection storage. And it's, it's a very basic building. It's a big cement box with environmental controls, uh, sealed concrete floors, <laughs> nothing fancy. Thank you. Councilor Erpenbach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins, for being here. I appreciate it. This is exciting. We've been down quite a long road and getting to this point where we can say it's old. Um, would you remind, there are several council members here today that really don't know the history, and you've explained sort of the high-level view of it. Can you talk just a little bit about how we planned um, originally to fund that, and now that you're, and you're, you admitted you're guessing that the price has gone up, and that's probably a good guess that it has gone up, we don't know how much. Can you talk about that arrangement that we have among, it's really a three-way split, how that three-way split works? My, my understanding of it is the private, that whatever the bid, the, the final bid would be, that um, the money that was privately raised would come out first, and then uh, as this agreement reads to me, the city and the county split equally the remaining, the remainder with a city commitment not to exceed $1.3 million. And, and that came about initially really because we were hoping that the sale of the land would net us at least $1.3 million and that uh, <clears throat> we, the original estimate we were working on when that agreement came about was about $3.8 million at that time. Okay, good. Then I would just encourage my colleagues, as Mr. Hoskins said, plan, don't go on a day like today, but plan a day 
and spend a couple hours with Bill at the museum and tour at least the old courthouse. The Pettigrew home is beautiful as well and wonderful to see the, but your point is to go see why we have to build this building. I really want you to spend a little bit of time over there um, understanding this whole process and where this came from. So I appreciate you being here. I look forward to making this happen um, according to the agreement that we have with the county. Councilor Neitzer. Yeah, if it hasn't been sent out already, maybe it has, it'd be good to have a copy of that <clears throat> MOU. I've seen it and at least lays out what we've committed to. I think it's important for us to know that commitment's already been made. Mm -hmm. So if that could be sent out, if it hasn't I to think all of us. it already has. I maybe believe. it has, okay. Um, David? Yep. It has, okay, great. Uh, just so, just so um, we understand, would the county own the building? It, um, <clears throat> when Bob and Kari uh, gave the land, they gave it to the county on behalf of the museum with a, a number of different deed restrictions. And so I believe as, as <clears throat> the deal's been put together, the county is, uh, would be in possession, would own the structure, yes. I think that's the short answer, yes, the county, okay. is my understanding. And who is responsible for the ongoing operational, operational costs and capital well, improvements? It, in that agreement, um, the operational costs are envisioned to be split 50-50 between the city and the county, just like the museum's oper existing operations budget. And that uh, capital improvements would also have to come through the joint budget process between the city and the county. And finally, do you believe that you can, um, uh, is the timing of when you would be looking for us to make our contribution, could that wait until 2018? Can you yeah. cash flow the rest? Um, I, I think that, um, and we have a pretty conservative uh, timeline, but it's probably, I would guess we would be, if we, if we get things moving now, it'll be about a 12 month construction time period, and we would probably be looking at uh, the spring of 2018 for completion. Okay. So the answer is yes. I Thank you. That. Although I believe Mr. Litz uh, has, has had discussions about that. Hmm. Okay. Councilor Steely. Uh, just a, a few informational things for my, for my benefit. Um, I didn't realize that the, the, okay, the old count courthouse museum is the county takes care of all the expenses on that. They pay for all the, we have for each building a maintenance budget, one for the old courthouse museum, and that includes um, things like natural gas, electricity, alarm systems, custodial um, supplies, and so uh, Operational. On. And, and the Pettigrew has a similar budget just for it that pays the natural gas, electricity primarily, and there are some repair and maintenance uh, dollars in each budget for each year. And that, but the, the Pettigrew is coming out of our city budget. Yes, it uh, is. Okay. Um, so back to this, to the new building, and I know we've talked about the contract manager at risk form of building something. Is that something you're going to be looking at for this building? Um, I, I mean, just because you were talking about getting bids, and yeah, I see no, I, I, think I would believe that the general forward. contractor would be yes, a general contractor. If you wanna, good afternoon, Council Bob Litz from the County Auditor's Office, and uh, currently there's two forms of uh, uh, of construction that are. are prevalent, I guess, in today's building climate, and one of them is construction manager at risk, and the other one is design build. And uh, looking at this whole situation, I, I think that uh, if the auditor's office has any recommendation, it would be construction manager at risk. Anyone else? Councilor Kiley. So it'll be at that point in time, once you determine who's your architect and once you've made the selection of uh, construction manager at risk that you have firm numbers on actual costs. Right, we, we have an architect and, and we have the, the design works done. Uh, he is updating 
his most recent uh, estimates at this time. Uh, he's going to make a presentation to the museum board about that on Thursday of this week. I just don't have those figures for you at the moment. Uh, we won't know actual numbers until we bid the project. And, and your original, es your estimate that you mentioned earlier was 4.3 to 4.5? That's my uneducated guess. Okay. Because if we did come in at that with our responsibility 1.3, the county's 1.3, and the land was 1.429? Yes. I mean, we're just a little over four million, so we're still short anywhere from mm -hmm. three hundred thousand to a half million dollars. That that's accurate, and the museum board um, has discussed that they would raise the remainder. Okay. They've discussed it, but they haven't made a firm decision on that until <clears throat> I'm assuming until the numbers come out. Um, well, that's that's part of it. Is the numbers. Um, the museum has some donors who we've talked about in helping to close this gap, but uh, until I know what the gap is, I... Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Councilor Erickson. Thank you. Just um, for clarification, as we do the joint um, city-county meeting, um, just for my clarification, um, is that where you will bring the presentation forward or the proposal forward to us and we will approve or what are the steps for that? Well, what my understanding is the next step would be for the architect to bring the design, final design here and, and answer questions. And um, really, I, my understanding under the agreement is as a joint body, you're both saying, yep, this is the design we're, we're going uh, with. Uh, it's my hope that you will have a recommendation from the museum board to that effect, and uh, that the resources that have been raised to date would be uh, directed towards the construction of this design. Um, I don't have that at this point in time, but yes, that, that's the next step. And I need you to approve that as a final design and authorize the architect to prepare the bid documents. Just one more follow-up, if I can. Um, thank you for that. And then I just ask, if, it, since that is the way we do it, it, whatever information you get, if you can get it to us a little bit earlier so we can review it, look at it, make oh, sure everything. So we're just not seeing it for the first time of the meeting. It's a lot more helpful for us to, to get that uh, as we move forward since we only meet once a month with the county as well. But I believe we can do it additionally if, if we need to. So thank you. Councilor Kiley. And, and Bill, I know this has been going on since 2013 and that you had already previously selected an architect and you have initial drawings or plans. Can you inform us of what was that process in making that selection? Um, that's a good question. Um, we we um, worked with uh, Chris Schultz, who is an architect for Coke Hazard, many years ago, and uh, Chris was involved in the original concept design and made presentations of that concept design to the Minnehaha County Commission. It, it was the Minnehaha County Commission, uh, first in their building committee and then in a commission meeting that formally uh, entered into a contractual arrangement with Coke Hazard Architects to be the design uh, designer for this project. So you don't, you're not sure if an RFP had gone out and you received multiple proposals? <clears throat> At this moment, I can't, I can't, uh, I don't recall. Uh, that's usually the process with the county, um, but it was, it was a uh, contract signed by the county commission in uh, 2010, I think. Was it? Uh, that information would be helpful as well, too, so that we're assured that we're getting the best design possible. Okay. Councilor Starr. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Bill, just to change directions a little bit, 
give me an idea of what this archive building is going to be, not just for the collection. You talked about being able to store it correctly, and I think Councillor Erpenbach did a nice job of pointing out how important this is, but tell us about the dream of what the community and the public is going to be able to do at this facility. I know there's lots of items that are in the collection that don't necessarily fit into a display at the museum, but have their archaeological value um, or a, a benefit to, for research and family histories and uh, all kinds of research projects. So tell us a little bit about what this is going to provide for those type of people that are looking into, you know, that are doing research and are looking at the collection that's available. Okay. Well, we, <clears throat> we have... Um, uh, members of the public coming in daily, uh, most often to the old courthouse museum, and predominantly uh, at that site they use our um, photographic collections, probably the most used collection in, in the museum. Um, we also have our manuscript collection, which is located in the basement of the Pettigrew, uh, also Richard Franklin Pettigrew's library. Now, those resources, which very widely that are stored there from manuscripts um, regarding Senator R. F. Pettigrew to copies of the Polar Tech newspaper, which was the newspaper for the World War II Air Base, to the original minutes of the city council are stored in the basement of the Pettigrew, along with other collections. So if you have a researcher who's looking for um, those kinds of documents, we have to set up time for them to go to the Pettigrew and, uh, and, and get those. Um, if they're looking for other documents, maps, uh, photographs, they're mostly at the old courthouse museum. Uh, we also have several organizations that um, also share space in the building, the Sioux Valley Genealogical Society. Really, right now, if you're a member of the public, you may be going to several sites, or what the staff will do is try and round everything up for you in advance so it's in one place. Uh, this would be a much more efficient situation and really put the collection in one place. Um, and, and safety is a big factor for the public, the staff, the collection. Um, if you look at the old courthouse museum, one of our challenges, a lot of things are in the basement. Well, in December of 2012, we had uh, a small flood in the basement of the old courthouse museum. Um, th there are always those natural disasters that happen. We're hoping to locate the collection in one place will help us be more efficient in our, our use for the public and, and also provide a little more safety. Um, one of the things, the collection is literally stuck in every nook and cranny and corner in the old courthouse in the Pettigrew, and um, if we can move those things into one place, I, I think the management will be much more efficient than it is today. Uh, it will be much easier for the general public to come in to get to see what they want to see right at the time. We are envisioning public hours uh, when the research area will be open to the public and we'll have staff readily available to assist them. Um, one of the things also is we get the collection out of the old courthouse museum. Some of the space is really not usable, but some of the space we can use and we're hoping to be able to shuffle some offices, perhaps expand some gallery space, uh, provide for um, more efficient uh, use of our building maintenance area in the basement. Uh, also add a little storage space for exhibit materials and, and so on. Good. No, I think that's, that's, for me, that's one of the, the keys to this project is that if we don't, we can have all these archives and artifacts that are available, but if we can't have access or the public can't have access to them, 
are we really doing what our job as uh, doing that? So I think this facility is going to give the public access to more information and to the artifacts and archives um, in a much easier and simpler way so they'll have a chance to, uh, to be able to use them. And I think that's and we've, we've really made an effort in the last few years. We have public tours, behind the scenes tours, so the public can see what types of collections we have, see the types of storage and some of the challenges that we're dealing with. Thank you. Other questions? Councilor Selberg, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins, for the presentation. Very interesting. I'm just curious, who will the neighbor be that just purchased the 20 acres? <laughs> well, that was purchased by Sanford. Oh, okay. Other questions? I'll ask. I have a couple very quickly. Okay. Um, so I remember reading through the <clears throat> reading through the um, agreement. It indicated that any change orders would have to come before a joint um, joint committee meeting. Um, will not the construction manager at risk take that away and so it would be then just one person or two people making that decision number one um, <clears throat> rather than the full council and a few or not full council but the full council and commission and if that is the case are we setting up something where we would both have um, input um, someone maybe from our uh, administration or from from the council and uh, from the commission to make so, uh, some of those critical decisions as they come up. Well, Rex, <clears throat> the agreement was largely drawn up by lawyers, and I'm not sorry I didn't hear that. I said a lot of. The, I don't know. I, the the quick answer is I don't know the answer to that. Mr. Litz, do you have? <clears throat> it's okay. Uh, yes, Councilor, I believe that you're right. CMRA means that the uh, the constructor, the contractor would be at risk for all those changes. And I would also add that a lot of those things uh, would probably be in-house if they're smaller items, but if there's big structural changes to the outside of the building, uh, things like that, which are, you know, are unanticipated at this point here, I would imagine they would come before both bodies. And, you know, but that would have to be a, a very significant one. Other than that, trading, trading things out, uh, adjusting costs on certain materials used, uh, certain elements that are inside the building would be the construction manager at risk's choice. Yeah, we don't want to decide what color the bathroom I, I, should be. I, I don't think micromanaging, and some of those things might be, but I don't think micromanaging a project like this here, uh, I think that's uh, best left up to the experts. And then, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Kiley, to clarify something that you asked about earlier, uh, I don't, I, the county, when they, when they uh, expend county funds on a project like this, we're required by state statute to have an RFP for that. Um, I have not seen that RFP for the original design work, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm quite certain something like that happened. Uh, and I would also tell you that uh, since this design work has already started by one firm, it is common practice to continue on with them. Uh, because state law also allows us the specialty clause in there. And when somebody specializes in something and they've already started the work, it makes sense to continue on with them. Now, the, the bidding process would happen when we did uh, the selection of the contractor itself. But I think it behooves everybody to stay with the original design team that drew the, uh, the what I would call the skeletal outlines of the building. Of course, you have structural concerns. We have to have structural engineering. You have to have the mechanicals. Uh, you have to have water, plumbing, heating, all those sort of things will uh, have to be add flesh onto the plans that we have right now, and that's where your true bid costs will come in. Um, another thing is, you know, you pointed out that these plans are kind of old, and uh, generally speaking for a building of this nature, 4% is not an uncommon uh, number. It's right in the middle, somewhere between 3 and 5%, 4% for construction inflation per year. So if you look at that, you say 2013, it's uh, three years later, that adds $160,000 worth of cost to it, in my estimation, which is covered by the land sale and the original bid numbers at this point. Of course, uh, you know, you never know. I, I think the, the, the key here is putting the bid out at a certain time when people are looking for work and they, they get their pencil sharp. But if this bid comes out in the middle of the summer, uh, as you well know, uh, building bridges over on uh, my neck, neck of the woods there, th sometimes things go up and you have to wait till the next building season. But um, those, those are things I wanted to clarify for you. Sure. 
And uh, Go ahead. my request was just a little more information on that RFP Absolutely. process yes. just so that we know that going forward so that yes. we can be assured that it, it wasn't the only proposal that was brought forth, and I'm not saying that it was, or that we should even change design teams at this point in time, but just for six of us on this council, we, and, and that might have even happened prior to Councilors Rolfing and Erpenbach coming on too, it's just good information to have forward so we can answer questions of that nature. Well, uh, uh, Councilor, we'll do some digging and get that information to all of you. Great, thank you very much. Bill, I have one more for you. If Tony could put the, uh, the screen up on, uh, with the design, the drawing, he'll do it downstairs for us here or up there. Exterior. That's it right then. What's done? It's done. Oh, okay. Um, I'm talking to our magical guy we have in oh. the basement who controls everything. Um, the, um, I'm imagining that, um, as I think I've heard you say before, some, um, uh, not programs, but some, some displays will be stored in the artifacts area and other areas in there. How do you move those back and forth? Are those with a uh, fairly large truck that you would? Well, we, we, we move things with the truck or we have a van. Okay, I'm just, I'm just wondering, I don't see a docking area here. Actually, the receiving staging has a overhead door and we have the ability to actually drive a truck in at the north end in, into the building. Beautiful, that's what I was looking for, something there that would, that would work that way. I just, I didn't see it and I thought, you know, how could you not have a place where you drive a truck in to load some of this stuff in? And, but that's what I was at, that's the question it answered. So thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you all very much, Bill and, 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 and you. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Litz. And uh, for uh, thank you for coming in and, and giving us a background on this, and um, we appreciate it very much. Let's move on to our next um, next agenda item: uh, fire code revision. Um, Chief Dean Lanier. Council, good afternoon. Dean Lanier, Fire Marshal with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. I'm here to go through just a few of the proposed changes to the 2015 International Fire Code. Uh, I have just a few slides to go through briefly and hopefully answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I do like to review the principles of fire and life safety and why do we have a fire code. Uh, it does provide for minimum requirements for life safety. Uh, the goals are really to provide a reasonable level of life safety and property protection for both the occupants and firefighters during emergency operations. Uh, language that we really try to, uh, try to uh, make sure that that comes out in both our vision and the values of our organization in providing a service to the public. Uh, the changes that we are proposing for the 2015. Uh, first, we have some numbering changes that really were oversight on my part to do house cleaning and get those corrected so that the numbers correctly align. But secondly, we have a fee schedule change for the fire standby, and that's what I'll spend most of my time talking about today. So the fire standby is a fire and life safety precaution that's provided for oversight during a, in an event or a structure where fire systems are altered from their normal operations. And really, this comes down to primarily being used for public assembly businesses within the city of Sioux Falls. Normally, this is incurred when a fire alarm system is isolated. In some cases, yes, it's turned off. Uh, but most of the time, we're able to isolate isolate certain elements of it. Uh, very similar to your home, where you have smoke alarms, hopefully installed in the proper places and maintained in the proper way, uh, 
large assembly buildings also have smoke detection within them. They are primarily there to protect the exit route of those folks that uh, are attending that event. So often we have to uh, do some magic with those systems and able to, uh, in order for us to put on some of the shows, and I'll show you a couple examples of some of the reasons why we do that. Um, the common uses for fire standby, more than often, it is a pyrotechnic show and or fireworks inside a building. Now, normally when you say those words together, people's antenna go up because you don't think of fireworks being on the inside of the building, but there is a absolute fire code that allows it. Uh, there are precautions that we go through. Uh, we have quite a bit of pre-notification by especially the bigger acts that come into town. Uh, they let us know weeks in advance of their arrival. In, in many cases, they have professionals that are traveling with them that do this in multiple uh, large venues throughout the U.S. and across the, across the globe. So this is not new stuff for them. They have been through this multiple times. Uh, they know what they're doing from the very first day that they show up. Uh, often we also see haze uh, and laser show effects in some of these larger events. Uh, yes, we've also had an event where we had open flames, one here just recently. Uh, and you commonly see them in places like the Premier Center, Washington Pavilion, the District, the Orpheum Theater, and yes, Bad Ladens Pond. Um, these are primarily larger venues. Uh, more times than not, several thousand people at a minimum inside these buildings and structures. And we are isolating the life safety systems inside. So yes, we are providing a fire inspector, one who understands both how fires get started, understands the systems very well, uh, and is able to take some precautions as well as take some immediate actions if there is an emergency and need for evacuating this building. I did try to pull up a couple of uh, examples for you. Uh, the first is a photo taken uh, to try to uh, understand how much haze is normally within a concert hall, or in this case, the Premier Center, when a show is going on. Hopefully the lighting in the background kind of highlights how much haze there is in the building. It's not so much where you can't see the stage, but it is a, there is a large amount of haze being pumped in the building. More times than not, it's just theatrical smoke. Uh, it's there as a theatrical effect to kind of identify on stage where exactly the, the uh, individual who's performing is at. Um, it does, though, however, require us to do, inside the Premier Center, we have to do some isolation of some, some of the uh, detection system in that building to be able to put this on. The system would not be able to operate without going off if we did not isolate some things within the system. This next show is probably an even better example of the amount of pyro. Uh, this actually wasn't too bad, for my estimation, as far as pyrotechnics are concerned. This wasn't too bad. There have been more shows that have caused me a little bit more concern. Uh, and yes, the name of the tour was the Burn It Down Tour. So it wasn't exactly, um, I didn't necessarily care for the, the, the name of the tour too much, but it was the first large event that we had in the event center. Uh, it was quite a dramatic show, but fire staff is there to make sure that the event comes off without a hitch. It is, there is a process that we go to to make sure that everything is going to be okay once the event starts. Most of these large entertainment shows will come in and they will actually do a pre-event show for us hours in advance of the actual show coming out. So we will see everything that they have and we honestly try to tell them, give it all to us. I mean, don't, don't cheat me on what you're gonna try tonight. Uh, let me see everything that you're gonna do so that we can sign off and say, absolutely, we're gonna be fine with that. There's not gonna be a problem. It's not gonna set off anything that we're not uh, already aware of and we should be able to get through the entire night without any problems. So in re reference to the fire standby fees, this is really a cost recovery for providing the service. Um, the fee amounts reflect an overtime rate for the fire inspectors. Um, our new language that we're proposing uh, 
adds a benefit factor to what is already the fire standby fee. Um, our goal here really is to manage the cost for this uh, standby fee within the new language that we're proposing. Uh, part of this, I sent out notification to every one of the businesses who we provided a standby service to in 2016. Now, to look back on 2016, we had over 100 events, well over 100 events, inside the city of Sioux Falls where we were providing this service. Um, there were quite a few events last year uh, where we uh, were, had standby people standing by yet. Uh, the new rate that we're proposing uh, is $90 per hour per inspector. Um, some of that is based on contract language and some of that is based on a factor that we're uh, providing for benefits for the fire inspectors. But that rate comes from those two different places. The, uh, the overtime cost, which is contract language, and then a benefits factor being applied now that will add additional cost to that and coming up to our initial cost of $90 per hour per inspector. Our key objectives are to continue providing this service at a level of cost recovery that we can actually recover some of those costs that we're putting out. Um, providing public safety venues with these full theatrical events, um, they are getting very uh, complicated in some of the things that are going on. Uh, you see more and more pyro shows that are becoming more and more uh, interesting. Uh, so we really do try to work with shows in advance of them showing up. Uh, everything from the stampede shows and their pyro that they do uh, at the beginning of the season all the way to the concerts that come through and all the pyro that might go on with some of the more uh, exotic pyro shows that we have. We are really trying to balance public safety with having an event and being able to do all these different theatrical effects inside this venue where acknowledged we're actually turning off some things to be able to have all this inside a building. So with that, I'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Councilor Neitzert? Can, I, I don't know if you said this, but could, could you clarify how much is charged now, if anything, versus what we will charge? Right now, we were charging strictly the overtime rate. Uh, and that was based on con contract language. That was around $55 per hour. Um, that had been in effect since 2007 when uh, ordinance was modified to reflect that overtime standby rate. Uh, what we're proposing is to move that up to $90 an hour and include within that, that that benefit factor that's being applied for benefits for those fire inspectors. Okay, and would you know if this is typical in the industry? If I go to other jurisdictions, I'll find the same. If I'm a promoter and I'm... Yeah, I, I didn't talk to any of the other fire marshals or any other promoters, but... From, from my perception from the promoters is that promoters actually have a pre-designed package that they send to us. Normally it's six to eight weeks in advance of a show. So we have uh, Eric Church concert coming up here in a couple of weeks and we have Monster Truck Show coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. Normally when they're going through these types of events, they're well in advance. They know exactly, especially for the elaborate pyro shows, they know exactly what, they're, what they have as a part of a show. They let us know about it in advance. They know down to the details of exactly which effect they're going to explode and when. Uh, so it's very well planned out in advance. And I, I, for the most part, they come with a script and they're just working off that script. So it's a pretty standard um, promotion. And, and finally then, it, am I correct? Would it be in a case where we have a public venue, is it the the entity renting the facility, like the promoter who they have a, they would be charged for that. It's not like we're you know, charging the event center who just charges it back to us and we're paying ourselves or anything. No, that's correct. The, the, whoever the event promoter is and the one that's actually responsible for the show uh, is the one that we write out the invoice to. Okay, thank you. I want to qu qu uh, clarify if I could, benefits factor meaning uh, retirement, uh, disability, um, uh, health insurance, those kind of things at the city, taking that into consideration when we're doing it. Okay. That, that's correct. Uh, in, in talking with HR about this, there's a, there's a standard factor that's being applied and it's covering those. That 30% or 40%, yes, something sir. like that. Okay. Uh, Councilor Knight, or Staley. 
So how many, well, I suppose it depends on the, the size of the venue, but generally how many inspectors would there be on site for this? So if we're gonna have a full event at the Premier Center, we provide two inspectors. And, and that would be for five hours? Generally, that's correct. It's uh, a, a normal show would start uh, at, at 6 to 7 p.m. and by 11 p.m. we ought to be packed up and done. Uh, however, we've provided two inspectors at the Premier Center because the size of the Premier Center just doesn't lend itself to us being everywhere and being able to monitor that building at the same time. So we have one inspector sitting in the control room which has closed caption cameras uh, we have another inspector actually up on the second level down at the end of the horseshoe in the open arena area watching everything that's going on. Um, how, what's the smallest venue that you'd have an inspector at? I think the district is probably the smallest venue or the Orpheum Theater. Uh, we've had a few events in there where we had to turn some things off. So, Like if, if a, neighbor, a neighborhood's having fireworks in, in the summertime, a group, they don't have to have a this wouldn't be affecting residential people or not at all outdoor events um, we have jazz fest uh, who's had pyro shows for the last couple of years none of that is required for that for an outdoor event no ma'am so what what differentiates jazz fest from something else uh, the fact that it's outside um, and by the standards and codes that are in effect now uh, we are really turning off elements of the life safety system for us to be able to do some of these more exotic pyro shows inside. And the, the inspectors that would be going to this then would be considered off duty? No, they are not. Uh, and that's why we're incurring the overtime because they are on duty while they are attending that event. Okay. I would remind everybody that fireworks are not legal to shoot off in Sioux Falls. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so neighborhoods shouldn't get together to do that, but just wanted to, you know, it might happen every once in a while. But I, well, it, it, I'm just kidding. Can, but can someone get a permit? I mean, like Jazz Fest does oh, it for that kind well, yeah. of thing? Yes, yes. yes. But the Absolutely. neighborhood getting together in, on Fourth of July well, is uh, okay. Yeah. So to give you some example, we have any number of different open flame permits during the summertime that are outdoors events. We issue open flame permits for those. Um, we have quite a few events that are outdoors that do a number of different things. Uh, the uh, baseball team has, on every Friday night, they have fireworks. We have a number of events that happen outside during the summer, but those are, those, because they're outdoors and we don't have as many life safety concerns with it, uh, those are a little bit easier for us to manage and deal with. Councilor Kiley. Well, and just to clarify, and, I, and you have in the course of answering different questions here, uh, a fire standby is when basically fire systems are altered from their normal operating functions. That's correct. So in this situation, when when you have groups that are using these different events or whatever it is, uh, you would have to go in beforehand, make the alterations, mm -hmm. uh, and then make the alterations back to their normal state again after the event. That's correct. Is the ins inspector on? Throughout the event as Throughout well? Throughout that event. Okay. So uh, that's normally how things end up, the timeline ha as it plays out. Uh, at the beginning of the show is when we're doing our, our first visual. Uh, before any of the public becomes in, uh, we're giving a thumbs up to the act as far as what they plan on, on uh, providing for effects. Uh, and then we start, we've isolated the system before they even start up their first show and tell of what they're gonna uh, set off for that night. And obviously the systems have to be altered for some of these events, otherwise you'd have fire suppression systems, sprinkler systems going off during the middle of an act. It, that is correct. Now, um, I would tell you that there are other venues throughout the US, and I've seen more than just a few of them at this point, who had uh, fire alarms go off in the middle of an event. So. Fortunately, uh, we have not had to have that experience here yet in the Premier Center. All the more reason for them to be up front and disclose everything they intend to do. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilor Selbert. Thank you. Um, this really is an important service being provided. My mind, every time I think of 
pyrotechnics in this goes back to 10, 20 years ago where you saw some of these shows where places went up in a matter of seconds. And um, have these, whatever you call it, pyrotechnic, what, however they produce these lights and these flames, they must have come a long way as far as safety and these type of things. Because I can't imagine you guys, when you sit there and see some of the things they do and you go, yeah, that's safe. But you know, honestly, the, the businesses here in the local area, uh, probably throughout the three-state region of uh, South Dakota, Minnesota, and North Dakota, we see the same contractors providing the shows. Uh, we've been able to have a really good working relationship with them, uh, and we've seen them multiple times over the last few years. Uh, so when, when someone asks them to do something that they feel uncomfortable about, they don't have too many problems with calling us and saying, you know, this makes me nervous, and I think you guys should take a look at this. Uh, I would be concerned with that if it was in a smaller venue. I think that's what you were alluding to a little bit earlier, where, you know, we've had some really bad consequences as a result of trying to have extremely elaborate pyro shows in very small venues. Have you run into that a lot where you've had to go, that's not going to fly? We've had questions about doing some things in smaller venues that right. I just asked them, that's not a good idea. And there's there's just no way we're going to be able to sign off on that. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. Councilor Erickson. Thank you. Just uh, switching gears a little bit, I know we've focused mostly on the um, this particular aspect of it. Any other changes in the, the code? I know last year we talked a lot about fire safety, floor protection, and things of those changes. Um, anything else that would no, draw attention to? No, ma'am. Just to? The, these two issues with the numbering as well as the, um, the fire standby fees are the only changes that we're offering at this point. Um, you know, the normal code revision cycle is almost every three years, so that churns out quite a few changes so I I really and, and thinking this through is the reason why we tried to offer something that we don't have to be back here every code revision cycle talking about fee changes so we tried to characterize this in a way where I'm not back here two years from now asking for the same thing we have some room to grow Wonderful. thank you yes, Councilor Starr yes thank you Mr. Chairman um, Dean we're do you, I, I guess I'm trying to get to the venues themselves. If we have what we need in ordinance for you to do your job, that the contractual agreements, I'm sure that the Premier Center isn't going to um, do a rental contract without um, those, this type of uh, protections in place. So I wanted to double check to make sure, is there anything outside of the fire code that we need for, that they have to, to get enforcement and that you have the working relationships that you need with these venues? We've, we've done a really good job in sponsoring those relationships with the venues, especially if they have events where they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna change the manner and method of what their normal operations are. So let's say a venue that's normally filled with chairs and tables is going to suddenly empty everything out and have standing room only band night. Uh, we do work with them and we do talk with them about all the issues associated with public and life safety, uh, making sure that they have enough exits, making sure the exits are clear, uh, clearly noted, and that the, the act itself that's going on, there's nothing odd or strange about that act that's going to gonna cause problems. I think uh, we've done a good job. We do have annual inspections of every one of those businesses throughout the year. We're talking with them throughout the year. So if there's changes within that, they see the same fire inspector. Uh, they have a working relationship with that individual. And our hope is that they would contact us before they would do something like that. Um, I, I think we have a good relationship with both the contractors who would provide this pyrotechnic or or some type of theatrical effect. And then my hope is that the type of relationship that we sponsored with the business owners is good enough that they would tell us before they would really go down this road. I can't recall an instance in which something has happened inside a large assembly venue that I really had a huge issue with. Makes sense, they start from that process. The only thing that is, as part of you talking to us today that stands out to me, um, excuse me, <clears throat> possibly is, putting something in that would require them to get you the, the plan six weeks, eight weeks prior to a show, 
um, that that might be something that we would want to look at at some point that not only does it, it has to give you an or so that it gives you and your staff enough time to review the the process and I don't know if that number is there or yeah. if it's still that that is tough uh, because if they, they try to put something together in a week or two and, and if it's too elaborate I just don't know if we can get them across that finish time in in, in that quick of a time period um, we do try to work with them on what they're doing uh, to try to make sure that we opt for the least uh, uh, that would be a public safety issue. Uh, we've tried all different kind of things. Instead of theatrical smoke, we'll try dry ice. Uh, we'll try any number of different things. We've also recommended instead of actual candles, there's some full candles out on the market they can use. So we're, we're trying any number of different solutions so that in effect, they can get what they're looking for, but we're also comfortable with the fact that everybody's going to go home that night. Makes sense. Thank you. So, Councilor Erickson. Sorry. Come back to me again. Okay. A couple other questions that I um, just want to discuss. So if I understand, has there been any dialogue with SMG or giving them any, hey, we're going to be doubling the rates. What do you think about this? What do other industries pay? What are the promoters thinking about this? Is that come up at all? So we sent out written notification to everybody who had uh, made use of this service over the last year. Uh, I got a few phone calls back uh, in talking uh, with SMG staff. Uh, we haven't really, I haven't had direct conversations, but they have talked with our staff. Um, there really wasn't a whole lot of conversation about problems or issues. Monetarily, that, you know, I think there's a bit of discussion back and forth that'll go on with the event promoters. Uh, when they come in, there's usually some discussion of how much am I paying for and what am I paying for. Uh, but in large extent, the larger acts, they expect us as a part of the event. Um, really, our focus has been trying to work with some of the smaller venue events to make sure that uh, somehow we can work through the details of this and get them to a point where they can have the event without uh, too many alterations or life safety issues. Okay, so and if I can have another follow-up. So do you have to have fire department folks there regardless if you have pyro or not? If there's no pyro and there's no need to isolate the fire alarm system in any way, no, we don't. Not? No. Okay, so no. what if there's no pyro and you have to have a firefighter there? Is it that $55 rate or will it be 90 regardless if you have pyro or not? We don't provide it for any events where we're not changing the a normal operation of the fire alarm system. But for example, if I can continue, I'm sorry. For example, like monster trucks is not pyro, but it's uh, breathing. Uh, and they're making yeah, sure so that's healthy in, in, rates in that, and when a, to stop. It's, that's I'm a little sorry. different. Yeah, that's a little bit different scenario where we're actually going through the building and monitoring the carbon monoxide levels inside the building. Um, yes, we provide standby for that because it's a little bit different nature of an event. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are also some other operations that are going on with the monster truck event that uh, we provide uh, safety oversight for. So, But you alter the, the system anyway, so that's why you have to do it. That would be one correct. of the reasons why. So, um, uh, just to clarify a little bit further. So uh, the state basketball tournament comes into town. There's no need for a standby. Okay. But all concerts, do all concerts have to have standby? Uh, some of them don't require haze, and we don't provide a standby for those events. No. Okay. Um, Did you have another question? I do have one more question. I would be curious to know, like, comparison of other cities sure. as far as, like, um, maybe comparable if it's Lincoln, Nebraska, or even Sioux City. They're close. I know we compare ourselves to Sioux City from time to time, and they have the event center there. Just maybe what their rates are in some of the other smaller communities. My my teeny tiny bit of concern. I believe in this. I think this is, is you know, a great service that we offer. My, my concern is, is if it's going to turn any events away, if it's going to adversely affect any one of that, and if the end, SMG or some of these places are going to be eating the cost anyways because of, of any pushback from potential promoters. Everything's <laughs> negotiable <laughs> when you bring these acts to town. I mean, from what's in the dressing room to whatever, everything's negotiable. And I just uh, just am curious in regards to that 
as we add more fees to it. But I understand it's a safety thing. I'm not saying I don't support it. I'm just Is there, can, we, can to see the comparisons between the two. We've also talked with SMG about scaling the standby based on the event. Um, not every event requires the upper level bowl to be open. Uh, many times they'll put the curtains down. So we've talked to them about, okay, how about, how, how about we changed the number of people standing by based on what areas are going to be open for the event. So if it's just the floor, yeah, uh, yeah we don't need two people. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. Councilor Kiley. Thank you. And just, just to clarify, the purpose of the adjustment in the fee, that's it is a cost recovery presentation here. Yes, sir. is to recover our true costs, our true investment. It's yes, not that we're going out attempting to make no, turning this into a money making venture. No. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bach. Thank you. I'm trying to make this make sense in my own mind now. What you're essentially saying is that for some shows, you're going to go in and shut off the sprinkler system, and in the place of the sprinkler system, you're going to have people watching to make sure that whatever they're blowing up on stage isn't blowing up the building as well. Correct? That's correct? Okay, so you've got the Premier Center booked for tonight, let's say, and the district also wants to do some fireworks and stuff inside. How, how do you manage that? Do you know in enough time in advance that, and how many, then, how many people are you gonna have for each one? You just said it depends on how big, of, how much of the event center they're gonna use. But as Councilor Erickson just said, we don't wanna turn away the folks that are coming to the district too how are you juggling that or are you just going to let the chips fall where they may and we'll just all hands on deck we're scaling it based on the size of the event uh how many guests are expected uh that's why i said again we're, we're working with smg to talk with them about you know if we're only going to have the floor level open on the event center uh, there's really no need for two personnel to be there uh, that's a that's a manageable crowd for one individual the same thing would apply with the district uh, we've had a couple of events there. We've only provided one individual for standby. Uh, our folks, uh, our fire inspectors who are providing this service, they, they, they do expect these events to happen. They understand that sometimes we're going to get six weeks of notification. Sometimes we're going to get two days. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't pushed back on me too hard about uh, the number of times that we get two-day notifications. Uh, they are understanding that our role and our function is to ensure that that event happens and there are no incidents or problems as a result and everybody's going home that night. So then just one other clarification, if I might, again, trying to put this all in my head. If, if you're the inspector there at the district that night, are you there just, you've got an SUV outside or do you come in a fire truck? Yes, ma'am. And do you then... If something happens, you flip the switch so the sprinklers go on and then you get that truck rolling too. Everything's going on as soon as they see a problem. Okay. So that discussion is with the management in, a, in advance of the event. Uh, they're telling them exactly what their, their objectives that they're there to accomplish. If there is a problem that's an immediate life safety risk, we're turning everything on and we're evacuating a building. They also have uh, our fire inspectors understand what's, what's happening that needs to happen from a fire response immediately. So their first truck that's arriving, they're talking to them on the radio before they even get there as to what the status of the building, they're doing a size up, they're telling them exactly where the problems are. So we are trying to make sure that the environment inside, because we've diminished the level of what would be normal life safety, that we are still providing a, a reasonable level of life safety to the public that's attending that event. Well, I appreciate that. You know me. My, I have a terrible fear of fire because of family, family in the business, right? And so I appreciate what you're talking about, and I just am really glad that we've had this conversation to this depth. I appreciate it. You know, this, if everybody's done, this is one of those things that we, as general population, we have no idea that the city of Sioux Falls prepares people, goes out to the district, goes out to SMG, et cetera, et cetera, and says, we need to protect the people in here. We need to make sure that this is done. Therefore, we've got to we've got to have people like uh, uh, Marshall Lanier and his people coming out and protecting us. Some of the little things that we've got to hire people for, and they're not little, and um, but because they do a good job, we don't have incidents. So <clears throat> we thank you. 
keep doing a good job, keep those things safe, keep our people safe in the, in the venues that we do have, and, uh, and I would just say thank you again very much for what you do. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, I believe that's all we have on the agenda. Uh, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. You guys all want to keep going? Oh, I just adjourned. I adjourned.